Hey chemists, how are we going? I'm going to talk through some metal production. So this is um, subtopic 4.4, which is materials, and then 4.4.2, which is metal production. Um, just to go through the learning intentions. Uh, so this is essentially what we're covering in this video. Um, just bearing in mind that there's some stage one um, content that is um, assumed knowledge from here. So um, concepts involving redox, metal reactivity, and electrochemistry from the stage one course. Um, this video is intended for you to um, use the, the summary notes provided uh, to pause at the appropriate time to fill in those summary notes as you go. Um, but apart from that, I think we're ready to get straight into it. So looking at some metal production. So first of all, we want to focus on the metal reactivity chart or table. So this is what was introduced in stage one chemistry. So the more reactive metals are at the top. So potassium at the top is considered the most reactive of the series. And the ones down the bottom are the least reactive. So silver and gold being the least reactive there. And we can see water being put in here as well. Even though it's not a metal, all of these are metals. Um, and the reason for that will become clear a little bit later on when we look at refining um, uh, some of these metals. So the most reactive metals up the top, they're the most easily oxidized and their ions are less easily reduced. So oxidation is the loss of electrons. So therefore, if it's easily oxidized, then it's hard to reduce. Uh, so those are the opposite, obviously. The less reactive metals down the bottom are the opposite. Uh, so they're less easily oxidized and their ions are less, uh, sorry, are easily reduced. So less easily oxidized. So to turn from the metal to metal ions um, is not very easy, but those ions turning back into the metal is easy. Uh, so we've got those inverse kind of uh, situations happening there. Um, the natural occurrence of metals. Now the, the whole point of this is metal production. So metals don't occur naturally um, uncombined. They generally are in a combined state particularly the more reactive metals. So those um, materials are called, those materials are called minerals. So here's some examples. We've got some reactive metals here, sodium, aluminium, zinc, iron, and copper, and the mineral forms that they take. So sodium chloride and sodium carbonate are some different mineral forms that contain sodium ions. So this is how we find these naturally. The more reactive metals, so the ones down the bottom of the reactivity series uh, shown previously, are actually uncombined in nature. Panning for gold is something that um, comes to my mind straight away. So the fact that you're sifting for those uh, specks of gold that exist uncombined, but you can't find these metals in an uncombined state in nature. We have to extract them. So why are most metals found combined with other elements? Because they're reactive. They have a tendency to lose electrons to form cations, and those cations will react with anions in order to form compounds. And we need ways to extract the pure metal to use it. So the ways to extract metal, are we going to use oxidation or are we going to use reduction? What's the way that we extract metals from those minerals? The answer is reduction, and I'll show you why. So here we've got the mineral zinc sulfide, and then we've got going to zinc. Now this obviously isn't a balanced equation, but we can see the oxidation number of zinc in zinc sulfide is plus two. That's because in a compound, the oxidation number is the same as the charge of the ion. And because this compound, uh, the sum of the charges is zero, there's no charge on this ion, that means zinc would be plus two oxidation number and sulfide, uh, sulfide would be minus two. Um, and then zinc by itself has an oxidation number of zero. So going from two to zero is a decrease in oxidation number, which is reduction. So to go from this to this, we need reduction. The same thing with aluminium oxide, plus three oxidation number. Aluminium by itself has a zero oxidation number. Three to zero, decrease in oxidation number. That is considered reduction. Reduction is what we want in order to extract these metals. So metal minerals are obtained from their metal ores. So we can't even start from the mineral. We have to start from a metal ore. So in a metal ore, there's other minerals in addition to the metal mineral present. So basically there's multiple minerals um, on the same uh, thing. These metals are collectively, oh sorry, the minerals, minerals are collectively referred to as gangi. So impurities or waste material. So anything that, um, that talks about gangi is a waste product for what we want. So we've got a couple of examples here. This one here is cinnabar, which is the dark material in the center. So this is the, the mineral that actually has the metal contained in it. So this is what we want. But the white calcite gangi on the outside is another mineral that does not contain any metal compounds. So that is a waste product product in terms of extracting the metal um, in the, the, the dark mineral in the center. There's another example here as well. 
So the stages of ore processing, how do we turn those ores into actual metals that we want? And we need to know these steps. So first of all, we need to dig the, the, the ore up. So that's the mining process. We don't need to know much about that apart from it needs to happen. Um, and then there's the four kind of chemical steps that we need to go through. So the first one is concentration of the mineral. The second is conversion of mineral to a compound which is suitable for reduction. The third step is reduction, which is the most complicated step. And that can have multiple, we have multiple ways in order to reduce um, a metal compound. We have electrolysis, carbon reduction, and roasting in oxygen. Um, all of those reduction methods are different depending on what type of metal we're trying to extract. And then a metal refining, if necessary, increasing that purity to something that we want. So step three, um, just note, there's three different methods. Just like I said, different metals use different methods of reduction. And which metal uses which method? It's based on its position in the reactivity series. So that reactivity series, um, going back, that is something that's really important. It's referred to again and again. So what are the reduction methods? The more reactive metals at the top, remember, easily oxidized, hard to reduce. Uh, so they, um, the reduction method used there is the electrolysis of molten metal chloride or metal oxide. This is very expensive. Uh, so these ones are harder to reduce in terms of um, the cost is usually greater. Zinc can be re um, reduced by electrolysis of aqueous zinc sulfate solution or carbon reduction of zinc oxide. These ones here, we need a carbon reduction of a metal oxide. These ones, roasting metal sulfide and oxygen. These ones, uncombined, no reduction required. So we've got four different steps there or four different ways um, in order to do that. Um, just bear in mind that these two overlap a little bit um, and the, this one and this one overlap a little bit. So that's how the three turns into four. So let's start from the top and use a specific example. We'll go through all these four steps. There's two common examples that are used, the extraction of zinc and the extraction of aluminium. So we're gonna go through those two examples in this video. So first of all, we're gonna look at the production of zinc from its ore. So it's found as a zinc blend or sphalerite, uh, which is ZNS at Broken Hill in New South Wales or at Mount Isa in Queensland, and that's exported to different parts of Australia. So the first step is the mineral concentration. So what do we do here? First of all, we need to crush the zinc sulfide. Uh, sorry, yep, zinc sulfide, um, which is, remember, the mineral that we're getting. So that's crushed into a fine dust in order to increase the surface area. So we've got a big mortar and pestle here. Um, that's not really how it's done, but we're crushing it using machinery. So basically that's happening. That's a physical process. We're not changing anything chemically there. We're literally just crushing it up into a powder to increase that surface area. The next concept is froth flotation, and this is to get rid of the unwanted material or the unwanted mineral, which is called gangi, and that's, again, a physical process. So what we do is the powder that we've just crushed up is mixed with water in a large flotation tank to form a slurry. So here's our flotation tank uh, filled with water, and here's our zinc sulfide, um, which is what we're trying to obtain here. So frothing agents are added e.g. pine oil or detergent, so they create froth or bubbles. So that's added into the container. Um, the collector compounds are then added, so sodium ethyl xanthate. So xanthate molecules are looking like this. So these are molecules that have um, uh, polar and non-polar parts. And we've looked at um, these kinds of materials before in um, concepts like micelles, so detergents and soaps. So we've got these uh, xanthates, which are water soluble. They have an ionic head and they have a non-polar hydrocarbon tail. So these um, xanthates are, are added as well. So the frothing agent froths it up. The collectors are um, the xanthate molecules, sodium ethyl xanthate being an example. Then what happens, the ZNS is ionic, so it's therefore polar. So the polar heads of the xanthate ion attach to the polar zinc sulfide. So basically, these molecules surround just like the micelles, so you've got that kind of um, ionic electrostatic attraction happening there. Um, so we've got the, the xanthates surrounding that zinc sulfide molecule. The other minerals, um, this doesn't really happen with those. So now we've got air being blown into a tank, just like when you were little and you had your cup of milk and you were blowing bubbles into that milk. That's literally what's happening here, except um, the, the 
chemicals that are used are not carbon dioxide. Um, we've got nitrogen and oxygen. Um, they're used because they're inert in the sense that they're not going to react with anything there. They're just providing bubbles. So the air is blown into the slurry. That's non-polar. So these are non-polar molecules. Therefore, there's not going to be an interaction happening with anything that we need there. The air bubbles are attracted to the hydrophobic tails. So non-polar, those hydrophobic tails, the bubbles will kind of rise and it will attach and kind of combine um, with those non-polar tails of the xanthate um, molecules. Therefore, the mineral will float to the top. It's going to grab it and make it come to the top. It's trapped in the froth and then it's skimmed off. So literally just something coming across and just cutting the whole thing off. And then the gangi, which is the impurities, that sinks. So that doesn't contain... The, the xanthates don't attach to the gangi and therefore it's not risen. It sinks to the bottom as a sludge and that can be collected um, as well. So that's um, the purification of the mineral. The next is the conversion step. So what does conversion involve? Roasting. So we can see our nice roasting uh, chicken in there. We've got leaching. So we're not, these aren't exactly what's happening by the way, but just to give you a bit of an idea, lynching, uh, lynching, leaching, and adding zinc power. Power, leaching, powder, not power. Anyway, so something to point out here is that this is a chemical process, no longer a physical process. We're actually changing something chemically here. So the roasting of zinc sulfide, the concentrate is roasted in air, so we're adding oxygen, and that forms an oxide. So we've got zinc, sulf um, zinc oxide and sulfur dioxide. Now, SO2, we've learned before that this byproduct can dissolve in water. Um, first of all, it spontaneously reacts in air to form SO3, but essentially we can use SO2 to make uh, sulfuric acid H2SO4, and that is actually a by so this byproduct has some economic value because sulfuric acid is something that can be readily used in a variety of industries. There's an environmental consequence of this as well because if we have emissions that aren't captured, they lead to acid rain because this is a strong acid leads to acid rain. Um, so it has some uh, uh, consequences there, but this equation is a must know. After we have the leaching step, so this sulfuric acid is used, so the SO2 can be captured and used as sulfuric acid, so that byproduct um, is can, can be reused in this reaction. And that converts zinc oxide into a solution of zinc sulfate. So zinc oxide plus sulfuric acid goes to zinc sulfate. So this is the conversion step. We've started with ZNS and we end with ZNSO4. And we've got water as another product as well. The next step is adding zinc powder. So zinc powder is added to displace any less reactive metal ion impurities. So if we go back to our um, reactivity series, so we're at zinc. So the ones that are less reactive than zinc, these ones down here. So any less reactive metal ion impurities, e.g. copper, cadmium, lead and silver, which will form a residue. It's a metal displacement reaction, so a single replacement reaction. This is going back to year 10 science. They're below zinc on the reactivity series. So some example equations. This is an impurity. We've got lead ions here. We add the zinc powder. The more active metal will displace the less active metal in solution. Remember, we've got this, um, uh, we've got this in solution here. Um, so we end up with the zinc ions and we've got the lead, which is a solid metal. So any less active metal, remember you have to balance an equation if you need to. So this is a plus one, so you need to have two silver ions. So all of these, um, uh, the zinc powder will displace those less active ions in solution. This step has to happen because otherwise these ions here will be reduced instead of zinc in the next step, which makes that refining step absolutely useless. So this must happen. Um, also be aware that some of these impurities are actually viable byproducts. Um, uh, lead, cadmium, silver, all of these are valuable. They have, um, they have some value to be sold um, or to use, be used in other reactions. So step three is the reduction of the metal compound into a metal. So now we have our zinc sulfate solution. We're going to undergo some electrolysis. This is another chemical process. So we've got an electrolytic cell here. We know it's an electrolytic cell because we have a battery here. So we're converting electric energy into chemical energy. Um, so basically we're forcing a chemical process to happen, which is really important. We've got two electrodes here. Um, we've got a lead electrode and a zinc electrode. Anode is positive, cathode is negative. Um, so here um, we've got an oxidation um, uh, reaction happening or no, it is a reaction, yep. So an oxidation reaction. Water is being oxidized here. So that 
is where um, the, the reactivity series again comes into play. And here at the cathode, we've got zinc being reduced. So I just want to go back to that activity series and look at the positions of water and the position of lead here. So we'll go back. So we've got, oh, sorry, I said lead, zinc. So we've got water here and we've got zinc here. So water is more active. That means water is more easily oxidized and zinc is more easily reduced. In a redox reaction, some you have to have them both happening at the same time. You have to have oxidation and reduction happening. So if the only species we have in here as zinc and sorry, zinc sulfate and water, because it's an aqueous solution, these are the only two species that can be oxidized and reduced. Sulfate is not going to do anything. Um, that's a spectator ion in this reaction. So the oxidation reaction, we've got water being oxidized to oxygen and we've got the balancing of our protons and electrons. That's the, that's the cohes balancing. That's really important that you need to know how to do it. But realistically, you just need to know that water is oxidized into oxygen. And we've got zinc being reduced. That's an easy one. Zinc ions to zinc metal. And you can combine those two half equations into a full equation. So this is what's happening at your anode, which is the site of oxidation always. Cathode, your site of reduction. Overall, balancing those equations out. When you're balancing, remember the electrons have to be the same. So four electrons, two electrons. Uh, the lowest common multiple there is four. So you would have to multiply everything in this equation by two. The electrons cancel out. So you have your reactants, which are two H2O and two Zn2 plus going here. And the products O2 plus four H plus plus two Zn going on here. And remembering this is obviously the, the important thing that we want. So why doesn't water get reduced in the cathode? I already covered this previously, but essentially the fact that zinc is under water, which means zinc is more readily reduced or zinc ions are more readily reduced uh, than water. Water can be oxidized and reduced. It can be reduced into hydrogen and oxidized into oxygen, as we already mentioned. An extra note, that's why we removed the less active metal ions in an earlier step, because they would be reduced in preference to um, the, the zinc, which is what we want, because that's the whole point. We, the majority of the reaction is zinc. But if we have some impurities in there, those will be reduced in preference because only one thing is reduced, one thing is oxidized. And it's always the easiest thing to be oxidized and the easiest thing to be reduced. So if we had, I know I'm kind of harping on about this now, but it's really important. Um, I'm going to go back. So if we're trying to reduce zinc ions um, and then we have copper ions present as impurities, those copper ions will be reduced into copper over the zinc ions being reduced into zinc. So why is the anode made of lead? Lead is not a reactive metal. It won't react with oxygen. Already making lead in the factory, the removal of lead ions in the previous step comes out as lead, and that's used as the anode. So essentially, we want inert electrodes because the whole point of those electrodes is to just be a site of positive and negative um, electrostatic charge in order to force those ions and to force those... It, it's basically the site for those oxidation and reduction reactions. We don't want any reactions happening with those anodes specifically. Another question, what happens to the pH of the electrolyte? What is the effect of this? So the pH decreases because we're producing H plus in one of the half equations. So it becomes more acidic and we end up with H2SO4, which can be reused in step two. Um, so again, another byproduct that can be fed back into a previous step of the reaction. Why is zinc using galvanized steel? So zinc is more reactive than iron, and zinc, iron, iron, and zinc will be oxidized more readily. This stops water and oxygen from reaching the metal underneath. In the past, when they used galvanized iron rainwater tanks, the cadmium and lead ions will get leached into water, which is poisonous. So essentially, zinc is a key factor in galvanized steel as opposed to some of these other metals which had toxic byproducts. So electrolytic production of more reactive metals, so more reactive uh, than zinc. If they're more reactive than, than zinc, they can't be produced by electrolysis of aqueous solutions of their compounds like we showed previously. If solutions of these compounds of metals are electrolyzed, the metal ion will not be reduced at the cathode because water is below them on the activity series. So water would instead be reduced to make hydrogen. This might be a reaction that could be useful, but in this instance, it's not because we want to reduce the metal ions. We don't want to reduce water. So there can't be any water present. Otherwise, that is the species that's going to be reduced. So from aluminium and above on the metal reactivity series, we need to um, have, we need to, they're, they're produced by electrolysis of their compound in a molten state. 
And the disadvantage of this is the high energy cost associated with it. So in order to heat that metal compound, that ionic compound at high temperatures in order to melt it and maintain that molten state, that needs a lot of energy. So that that's money, that's dollars. Um, so this is our second example, aluminium from its ore, because we use that different type of electrolysis. So bauxite is the um, mineral that we're looking at here. So it's bauxite has Al203 aluminium oxide, which is the mineral that we want. The uh, gangi is SiO2 and Fe203. Uh, so firstly, we crush the ore just like before, and we add concentrated hot sodium hydroxide, and that increases the rate of reaction in surface area. So that's basically a catalyst for that reaction. So that will react with sodium hydroxide. Um, so here we've got an acidic oxide reacting with a base. So some of that reacts to form an aluminosilicate. And remember that from the soils topic, that precipitates out of solution. Um, amphoteric oxide reacts with a base um, as well. And other impure um, oxide impurities do not react with sodium hydroxide. So basically the main one and this one, which makes an aluminosilicate, which can form a byproduct, which is useful. Those are the only things that react with the sodium hydroxide. Any other impurities don't react. That's why that reactant is used in this stage. So now we're going to look at the reduction of the metal compound into the metal. So first of all, we want the conversion of the aluminium oxide to aluminium by electrolysis. So what have we got here? We've got a bit of a compound here. It's a galvanic cell. It just looks a little bit different. So we've got a graphite electrode here. It's very heavy. Um, so we can see that's, that's over a ton. And we've got our molten aluminium oxide in here. We've got kind of heating coils, really, really hot. We've got that molten aluminium there. Um, and we've got our positive and negative um, electrodes there. So... What have we got? We've got an anode near the top. We've got a cathode, and that's kind of around the sides here. Um, the cathode is the site of reduction. So the aluminium is reduced at the cathode. So aluminium ions going to aluminium metal. The O2 minus, so the oxide ions, are oxidized at the anode. And the ions, so the anions mitigate towards the anode. That's near the top, so they're going to basically come out. So the oxide ions are Ox, um, oxidized into oxygen. So that's um, loss of electrons there because the electrons are on the right hand side. This is reduction because the electrons are on the left hand side. This is our balanced equation here. Remember, we need to balance out those electrons. The lowest common multiple of three and four um, would be 12. So you'd have to times everything here by four. Four times three is 12. And then everything here by three in order to get that full equation there. No, because of the high temperatures in this cell, the carbon anodes burn in oxygen to pr um, produce carbon dioxide. So there is a bit of carbon dioxide byproduct as well, just um, as a bit of an example, um, or just some context in terms of the um, environmental consequence. Why does the anode, so this thing here made of graphite, need to be replaced every two to three weeks? Uh, that's because the anode actually burns off. Um, and the continual replacement of these anodes is a major expense for the refinement of aluminium. So just another example, those high temperatures as indicated by those magnificent flames down the bottom here. And the fact that the anode on this um, kind of graphite electrode needs to be replaced so often, um, that's um, something that contributes to that high cost. So using molten Al203 uses a lot of energy. What would be the effects of using aqueous aluminium chloride. So this could be another example. We wouldn't need as much energy because it could be done as room temperature and not as expensive, but you won't produce aluminium because it's an aqueous solution. It has water. Water's reduced in preference. So the whole exercise would be a complete waste of time. So that's why knowledge of chemistry is so important in industry in order to set this up correctly. There's infam extra info in your notes in regards to economic factors, environmental factors. I've covered a few of those and uses of aluminium. Um, aluminium foil is the most basic one. Um, uh, there's more information about the, the kind of consequence of this. So chemical reduction with carbon. So that's another way that we can actually extract these metals. So carbon reduction, it's for metals below aluminium. So I'm not going to go back to the activity series, but you can see that there's a few metals below aluminium. aluminium and I've got a few examples down here. You reduce the metal oxide with carbon in high temperature furnaces called smelters. So here's an example here. We've got a person that's fully protected lead aprons, uh, a medieval looking helmet, and they're putting um, a compound into a furnace. Um, in order to smelt that compound. Zinc, iron, copper are produced this way. So every time you're getting these oxides, copper oxide, zinc oxide, um, iron oxide, you're adding carbon because we're reacting with carbon in those higher temperatures. 
and we've got a bit of an exchange happening. So the oxides add onto the carbon. So carbon dioxide is always the product and we've got the metal by itself. So if you just remember, you're starting with an oxide, you're ending with the substance, you're smelting, so you're reacting it with carbon and then you've got a um, acidic oxide, carbon dioxide being produced. So to finish off, a past exam revision question. Discuss the chemistry involved when extracting magnesium from pure MgCl2. So basically it's saying, how do we get magnesium from magnesium chloride? So what kinds of things would you cover? We're not going to go through the whole question here, but the things that you should cover include magnesium is reactive. So therefore it's going to exist in a combined state. We're using electrolysis in order to separate the magnesium from this compound. The electrolysis of a molten substance, not in an aqueous solution. Why would that be? You're explaining. So the explanation involves magnesium being a reactive substance. And if we if we were to reduce magnesium ions and water was present, water would be reduced in preference to magnesium because it's lower on the activity series. So referring to that activity series is important. By the way, you get that activity series in the exam. Do not stress about memorizing that. Include the equation of re the reduction of water. So water is reduced to hydrogen and then you need a balance using your cohese. Anode equation, the cathode equation. So um, the anode equation would be there. Um, anode and, oh sorry, that's something uh, different. That's okay. Anode and cathode would be graphite because that's an inert electrode not involved in the reaction. We've got higher temperatures because we need that molten um, ionic compound. What are the disadvantages of this? It's very expensive. The higher temperature to keep that molten state, lots of energy required for the electrolysis. So in a nutshell, the method used depends on the reactivity of the metal. High reactivity electrolysis, and that's split into molten or aqueous electrolysis. Low reactivity chemical. So um, the, the chemical reactions involving uh, smelting, uh, for example and um, reacting with oxygen. So the steps, mining, we've got open cut mining and shaft mining. So open cut, closer to the surface, cheaper, more harmful to the environment. Shaft mining, deep under the surface, more expensive, everything's underground. The ore concentration to remove the waste materials, which is the gangi, then the conversion to form a suitable um, compound for reduction, then the reduction process, and then refinement if necessary, which we didn't really go through, but that's just further electrolysis. Hopefully we got something out of this, guys. Um, thanks very much, and I'll see you soon.